For 25 years, residents of Taj Nagar village near Gurgaon lobbied for a railway station in their village. When their demand was not met, the villagers decided to take matters into their own hands. They pooled in 21 lakh rupees and built a railway station on their own. Most of the 3000 people living in the village are farmers. But such was the burning desire to have a station in the village everybody contributed according to their capacity ranging from 3000 rupees to 75000 rupees they donated money for the station and we started the construction in january 2008 said ranjit singh a former village sarpanch there are a large number of people in the village who need to go to gurgaon Delhi and Revar There are students who go to colleges Till now we had to either go to Halimandi or Patli to catch a train Both the stations are 6 kilometers away from Taj Nagar We thought when the railway lines passed through the village we would have a station here But that didn't happen So we raised the demand in 1982 and have been continuously asking for it but the railways told us that they did not have funds So finally we decided to craft our own destiny said Hukmachand a member of the committee As a result the panchayat passed a resolution in 2008 saying that since the railway was not able to build a station for them they would do it for themselves and with their own money soon an 11 member team was formed and the team started collecting money from villagers on 7th january 2010 as a result of their efforts the first railway station in the country on which the railway did not have to spend a single rupee started operations for more video subscribe our channel एड अ स्किल बाय प्रीतेश वडगामा सीतापुर स्लाइट इन रूरल उत्तर प्रदेश ओवर 60% परसेंट ऑफ हाउस होल्ड आर विदाउट पावर Sitapur district is one such place with no power a small social enterprise called mera gaon power mgp is trying to change things they are putting to solar panels at a time in just over a year mgp has connected more than 3500 customers to solar power mini grids at a village level village by village NGP is building a network of low cost solar microgrids that provide to led lights and a mobile charging point to all paying households at a cost of 25 rupees per week that is cheaper than kerosene which can cost almost double across a month solar power as a smokeless source of light comes with added benefits to customer health Installing a microgrid is a grand event in the village and everyone gets involved. In the village of Damdampurva, the team maps the village house by house beneath the scorching midday sun, working out where to place each wire so as to connect customers to the power source. Some householders join in while others look on, calling out orders or watching the curious proceedings wide-eyed. The roof of a sturdy brick walled home in each village is always chosen as the site for the panels and the battery. Ajaz, one of the company's first electrician to be recruited from the local district block of Reusa, installs the panel in a southerly direction to capture as much sunlight as possible. We are saving our environment with these lights. and there's no pollution in our homes either says a farmer from the village 
New businesses are starting to emerge amongst the customers too, says another. In one village, customers are using the light to weave saris by night. In another, one man now has a night business making plastic tablecloth, he says. It's nice to have light while we cook and eat. Our children are also studying more now. For more videos, subscribe our channel. Add a skill by Pritesh Vadgama. Palakkar Public Library In Kerala, the Palakkar District Public Library has been set up and running since September 2013. It is a fine modern library, a center for information, knowledge, wisdom, cultural activities, research and reference. But it has recently been in the news for different reasons. A third of its thousand members are women. These women, supported by the shared space the library offered them, launched a women's unit in February 2014. The unit got together to discuss methods of empowering women. The library opened its halls for film screening, workshops in home economics or gardening child care or the arts, and for women to get help in managing family conflicts, legal disputes, and professional problems. The secretary of the library pointed out that through reading, women would realize their own strength and forge a unity. It was noted that the lending libraries of earlier times were disappearing and the present rural reading rooms were too often full of only male readers. The unit discussed that if the once well-read women of Kerala continued to squander their hours in front of television, it would encourage a climate in which women are afraid to go out after dark. So, the unit has formulated plans on opening separate reading rooms for women. Palakkar's district library stands tall as a beacon to encourage women's empowerment through classes, clubs, workshops, and reading rooms. And then, there are the books, which will provide the women the strength they need to make good use of these opportunities. For more videos, subscribe our channel. Add a skill by Pritesh Vadgama. May I help you, sir? Grin the short, narrow-eyed salesman inside the Super Robots Plaza. Well, Prem Chopra responded, I wish to purchase a robot. For help, sir, completed the salesman. That is our specialty. We manufacture efficient robots for industry, construction companies, Plumbing and cleaning, caretakers, they are designed for only specialized work. Our best ones are for consumers like you for the home, he spoke like a recorded program. Yes, that's what I want. Prem Chopra spoke in a business-like fashion. Please, come this way. The salesman led him through a brightly lit richly carpeted gallery into a huge dome-shaped hall glowing with fluorescent light. The right corner appeared to be crowded with robots in metallic silver, electric blue and green. Some were moving about as if practicing to walk while some stood still switched out of operation. Just as Prem Chopra stepped on the threshold of the hall, one of the robots swiftly came forward. Good day, sir. Welcome to Super Robots Plaza. We hope your visit here proves worthwhile, 
the silver robot said in a metallic voice. Brilliant, mumbled Prem Chopra, somewhat bewildered. The salesman gave a proud smile as he headed towards an isolated robot in a metallic blue. This one is perfectly programmed to function in the household, cleaning, arranging, collecting groceries from the supermarket, tending the lawn, mailing letters, relating your programs on the TV and selecting news of your interest from the paper. The salesman paused for breath and continued, All you need is a remote control monitor for command. You mean sitting at home I can command the robot in the city market? asked Prem Chopra. It operates within a limited radius of a kilometer. By the way, this one is called Ram Singh 070, the salesman explained. Prem Chopra nodded. The salesman demonstrated the gait, grip, movement and some programmed functions. Everything was well-tuned and fixed. Prem Chopra seemed satisfied with the deal. I must tell you, like all robots, and adhering to the discipline of robotics, Ram Singh has an inbuilt system of three principles, the robot will obey his master, the robot will not harm humans, and the robot will not take harm to self. Prem Chopra heard the first principle and it impressed him. He did not take notice of the other two. He nodded delightedly and assigned the sale deed and contract of no misuse of the robot. He had now got a servant and an accomplice. If Ram Singh 070, my robot, can shop for groceries, then why not for better things like jewels, thought Prem Chopra. In the market, robots carrying heavy packets, buying theatre tickets, carrying groceries to the cars were common sight, but still strange and amusing servants. Ram Singh 070 was thoroughly efficient. With tremendous speed and accuracy, he collected the groceries into the shopping trolley and paused for the next command. Two kilograms of mangoes ripe and juicy, commanded Prem Chopra from a distance, seeing a huge pile of mangoes. In no time, Ram Singh 070 had selected the best ones. Pay at the cash counter, Prem Chopra spoke into the commander. Ram Singh Dash 070 followed Prem Chopra like a faithful dog when he stopped at Gopal Jewelers. Through the glass window he saw a generous display of gold ornaments. Quickly Prem Chopra disappeared around the corner and spoke into the remote control softly and clearly. Pick up a necklace and hide. No noise. Information not to be revealed. Top secret. Otherwise I will defuse your system, he threatened. Ram Singh 070 moved inside the shop, close to the counter. His metallic palm extended forward silently and a necklace went into the storage unit without a clink or a jingle. Nobody took notice. From expensive antics to ornaments and precious stones, the shoplifting went on for some days without any trace of anxiety and recognition in the beginning. But the confused reactions of shop owners gradually became louder. Unaware, Prem Chopra went on with his shoplifting spree until a young fruit vendor noticed an expensive bunch of Afghani grapes disappearing inside the metallic blue robot. The incident was related all over and no sooner had they heard than some shopkeepers recalled the presence of a metallic blue robot in their shops before their valuables were missing. 
This information reached the police headquarters in no time. One day Prem Chopra guided Ram Singh 070 to Javeri Brothers for lifting precious gems. The police was waiting in readiness and the computerized cameras capable of split-second recording clicked him in the act. Ram Singh robot was caught, but Prem Chopra fled as soon as he saw, through the binoculars, two persons noting down Ram Singh's license number printed on his metallic neck. Prem Chopra was arrested from his home as the owner of Ram Singh 070 The Thief. Soon after his arrest, Prem Chopra was released on bail until the court hearing. None of the stolen articles was recovered from his house. He had cleverly disposed them of through his gang. In the court he denied all the charges. Someone else seems to have tampered with Ram Singh 070's programs. The police found me at home, he argued. Counsel Goyal cleared his throat and reached closer to the judge. Considering Mr. Chopra's explanation and the happenings of the last few days when so many jewelers and curio dealers have been affected, it seems important to know the working of Ram Singh Robot. I request Ram Singh Robot to be called in the court. Robot goes to court were the headlines in the next day's papers. The next day, the court was overcrowded with people keen to watch a robot in the witness box. Counsel Goyal was ticking points till the last moment. He appeared confident and crisp but so was Prem Chopra. Never would this machine man betray his master. The proceedings began and Ram Singh 070 appeared in the witness box. Your Honor, Counsel Goyal began, I am told by super robots that the memory tape designed in these types of robots contains information of the previous week. But the case started a fortnight after the incident, the needed information must be wiped out. The judge said. Counsel Goyal smiled softly staring at Prem Chopra. Sir, the robot has been switched out of operation ever since. Prem Chopra's face fell but he was confident Ram Singh 070 would obey his master. The secrets were sealed. You may continue, ordered the judge. Counsel Goyal turned to Ram Singh Robot. Who is your master? He asked briefly. A dull blue light flashed and after a momentary whirring sound, the robot squeaked in his metallic tone, Mr. Prem Chopra. What did you do for Mr. Prem Chopra? A pause, a whir, then a metallic answer. Cleaning. Mowing the lawn, washing, doing dishes, shopping. Recall in detail your activities of last six days, Counsel Goyal interrupted. The memory tape went on mechanically and monotonously opened the boot of the car, emptied the grocery, shut the boot, turned, moved 30 steps, stopped, curio shop on the left, instruction signal blank moved left, turned 20 steps. At this point the council commanded, stop, reverse and play. Again there was an obvious pause after the instruction signal. Council Goyal stopped the tape. Notice the pause, your honor. Some action is not revealed. What were those instructions? Who gave these instructions? He questioned Ram Singh 070. Information not to be revealed, he responded. But why? 
Robots do not disobey masters. Several people who have suffered losses will be harmed if these instructions are not reported. What were those instructions? Counsel, lawyer, Goyal persuaded. Robots do not harm people. Ram Singh 070 responded mechanically. Many, many people have suffered. Speak up. Ram Singh 070, counsel, lawyer, Goyal stressed each word. No, Ram Singh, Prem Chopra shouted nervously but the judge warned, keep quiet. Come on Ram Singh 070, the judge said. Ram Singh 070 jerked his head left, then right towards the judge. A clicking sound indicated the hampering of running tapes and jamming of caution signals pip 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 pip. The crackling sound and the indigo light intensified. A red light flashed on the forehead of Ram Singh robot signaling danger. Reporting system failed. Tiny shutters in the center of his chest opened displaying a small TV screen flashing. System disintegrated. Ram Singh robot had diffused. Oh no, cried the salesman of super robots. He is diffused, he is dead. There was a horse in the courtroom. Silence prevailed for long in the courtroom. The counsel cleared his throat and said, Robots do not cause harm to people and neither can they disobey their masters. Those instructions from Mr. Prem Chopra were not to be revealed. They could have been injurious to his own existence, a threat to the robot's life. If he revealed them, he would disobey his master. If he did not, he would harm others. This conflict brought Ram Singh's end. He chose to break apart rather than to tell a lie, hurting human beings or becoming unfaithful. Traces of pain and depression marked the counsel's face. The judge pondered for a while and proclaimed, the court declares Prem Chopra guilty of theft. The council picked up his file and with a bow left the courtroom. For more videos, subscribe our channel. Ed a skill by Pritesh Vadgama. Arun Krishnamurti was just 17 years old when he founded the NGO Environmentalist Foundation of India, EFI. Beginning with the turtle walk a move to save turtle eggs and young hatchlings in Chennai, today Arun and his team of volunteers have cleaned beaches and various water bodies in Chennai, Hyderabad, Delhi, Coimbatore and Puducherry. The team cleans lakes, beaches and zoos, plants trees, educates people through street plays and also makes environment-friendly paper banks. Arun's team has students who joined him when they were in class 7 and continued to work with him even after 5 years. Which experience as a child inspired you to take up the cause of the environment? What was your first activity? A beautiful lake next to my house which once had a lot of birds, frogs and snakes, was heavily polluted. It led to the spread of mosquitoes and turned a lovely place into an ugly neighborhood. This hurt me badly and I wanted to do something about it. I got together with a couple of my friends and cleaned the pond next to my house. This was the first activity. What kind of support did you get from your parents and teachers? Was there any conflict between study time and activism? I have supportive parents who understood that my interest was the environment. They have never stopped me from doing what I want. On my part, 
I also made sure that I did not fail my parents in any way. I always informed them about everything that I did and took their advice before jumping into actions. I have teachers who taught me how to go about things. They also taught me humility so that I did not become snobbish or arrogant and start thinking I was a superstar because I was doing all this environment work. They taught me to be simple and keep learning all the time. I am not an activist, I am an environmentalist. I have learned so much by doing this work. How did your school and college further your interest? Both my school and college had plenty of green cover and both were home to several other life forms. This made me understand their importance, how beautiful they are and why we need to protect them. These animals are on their own, find their own food and are always active, on the move and never lazy. It is so positive. We have a lot to learn from them. Did you feel any hesitation in quitting a well-paying job and venturing into this full-time? What were the options you weighed before you arrived at your decision? It is always good to decide in favor of what you really love to do. I quit my job at Google, but I still keep in touch with my friends there. So only my duties at Google have come to an end not my emotional bond. I understood that I had to leave the job at that minute in 2010 or else I would never be daring enough to do so. I could not sit back and enjoy life when environmental damage was happening on such a large scale. I wanted to do something and that something needed my full attention. So I left Google for EFI. What kind of garbage do people throw into water bodies? How do you deal with the removal of this garbage once you clean the water body? Everything from a diaper to worn out slippers we find everything in our lakes. This is so disturbing because it is water and water is the basis of life. How can we not care for these water bodies? We use this garbage for landfill with no or minimal exposure to the outside environment. We ensure that the lake area and water holding are free of garbage so that birds, frogs and snakes can live in peace. How many days does it take to clear a large lake? Do you use any special equipment for cleaning and safety? Depending on the size of the lake and the amount of garbage, it can take nowhere between 5 days and 3 months to completely clean a lake. We have our tools like rakes and spades. What kind of protective gear do you use? Can you describe the cleaning process briefly? We wear nose masks, sanitary gloves and carry rakes and spades with which we collect the garbage and dump it into collection buckets which are taken to the garbage truck. We also use heavy machinery like earth movers and poplane to dissolve the lake and clear the weeds and shrubs that are harmful. What, in your opinion, can children and young adults do for the environment? What could be a small beginning by all of us in terms of protecting the environment? Firstly, we should all stop throwing trash outside our homes. Next, we should reduce the amount of trash we generate. Straws, tissues, wrappers, batteries, fast food junk, all these end up in lakes and they come from our homes. If we can reduce the amount of garbage at home and if we can dispose all garbage safely, that itself is a great deal. Every student is welcome to volunteer with us in helping the environment. How much time do schoolgoing children need to devote, in say a ache, for an environmental cause? Four hours a weekend that is two hours on Sundays and two hours on Saturdays. This small beginning is more than enough to ensure larger participation later. How can students and schools join your fraternity? 
Do you have any programs to introduce your work to them? Yes, we offer fellowships to interested students. Our program looks at young animal lovers, young wildlife photographers, filmmakers, theater artists, and scientific researchers. We give them training in these areas and get them actively involved in all our work. Our youngest volunteer is in class 3. For more videos, subscribe our channel. Add a skill by Pritesh Vadgama. The good Lord was extremely busy that day. He was into his sixth day of overtime. When he was working with full concentration, an angel appeared and commented, You are taking so much care for creating this creature. That's true, said the Lord. Do you want to know the details? What are they? The angel was curious. All her parts should be movable and replaceable too. She has a lap that disappears when she stands up. I have to endo her with a kiss that can cure everything from a broken leg to a broken heart. Moreover, she has to have six pairs of hands. She must be able to run on any food available and should have three pairs of eye. The angel shook his head slowly and said, A mighty impossible task, I suppose. Six pairs of hands? No way. No, these hands are not a problem for me. It is the three pairs of eyes that the mothers have to have. Lord looked puzzled. Oh, so you are creating a standard model of a mother? But three pairs of eyes? What for? The angel got interested. One pair that sees her children through closed doors. Another pair to look at the children and say, I understand and I love you without uttering a word. And the third pair to see all secret things without opening them. Lord, requested the angel. Please go to bed. Do not take so much trouble in a single day. I cannot, he refused. I have almost completed the work. I have put the best of my ideas into this model. Now this mother will heal herself when she is sick. She would be able to feed a family of six members only on half a kilo of cabbage. And she would manage a child's bath, play, study, food and sleep. Without getting irritated. The angel went round the model of the mother very slowly. He touched it and said, It's too soft. But very tough, said the Lord excited. You cannot imagine what this mother can do and endure. Can it think? Not only can she think, but can reason and compromise too, said the Lord. The angel was impressed. He went closer to the model and moved his finger across the cheek. Oh Lord, her eyes are leaking. How did this happen? It must be a tear. I have not put it there, dot it is a miracle. The Lord exclaimed. But, what is a tear for, my Lord? It is something unique. Maybe it is for pain, joy, pride, disappointment, loneliness, the Lord explained. What a wonderful creation. For more videos, subscribe our channel. Add a skill by Pritesh Vadgama.
Playing with Fire One of our favorite festivals in India is Deepavali or Diwali as it is known in the north. There is nothing to match the excitement when crackers go off in the night sky with a loud bang and a brilliant shower of colors. Many of us might wonder how these fireworks are made and what goes into them. The physics and chemistry of fireworks is as interesting as the sound and the light they emit. The science of fireworks is technically called pyrotechnics from the Greek word pyvaya meaning fire and technics meaning an art. Pyrotechnics includes not only fireworks but also a whole range of devices that use similar materials and principles from safety matches that we use every day to solid fuel rocket boosters of the space shuttle. The household match is considered a special pyrotechnic device as all the pyrotechnic effects heat, smoke, light, gas and sound are present in it. Some historians say that black powder, the basic material used in fireworks, was invented in India. Shukranti, written more than 2000 years ago, has references to weapons similar to guns and projectile weapons. However, the Chinese are generally considered the pioneers of pyrotechnics. They are said to have developed black powder more than 1000 years ago. It took at least 200 years for the knowledge to spread to the West, and it was only in 1240 that an English monk, Roger Bacon, revealed the formula for black powder. He considered it such a dangerous substance that he wrote of it in a code language. The basic formula of the black powder, or gunpowder, has remained unchanged for centuries. It is a blend of potassium nitrate charcoal and sulfur in the ratio of 75, 15 and 10 by weight. It is almost the perfect combination as it is and no further improvements or alterations need to be made. Experts say that this might be the only chemical product still using the same age-old proportions and manufacturing techniques. However, with the development of modern chemistry, Light and color effects have become common in fireworks. In the last century, the discovery of aluminium, magnesium and titanium, which burn at high temperatures emitting bright light dramatically improved the brilliance of fireworks. Similarly, colors too are a recent development. The principal color emitters in pyrotechnics were identified after decades of research. These colors are formed in one of two ways luminescence and incandescence. Incandescent light is produced when a substance is heated so much that it begins to glow. Heat causes the substance to become hot and glow, initially emitting infrared, then red, orange, yellow, and white light as it becomes increasingly hotter. When the temperature of a firework is controlled, the glow of its metallic substances can be manipulated to be desired color at the proper time. The principle behind any firework is that when heat is applied to fuel, the gunpowder, it burns using oxygen. However, because the fuel is packed tightly to keep the heat in the burning takes place all of a sudden, it causes the characteristic loud noise. The actual manufacturing process of firework is simple. The raw materials required are fuel, binders, oxidizers to make it burn and a few other materials. The ingredients are ground and mixed well. The mixture is pushed through a machine from which it comes out as long rolls or strips and then rolled in cardboard or old newspapers with a fuse. The greatest danger of pyrotechnics is that it deals with fire. The industry is notorious for its accidents, whether in the USA, Japan or India. Though the mixture is stable if kept cool and dry, it can catch fire if heat is accidentally applied through too much friction sometimes or from a spark or an impact. 
scientists are looking for ways of making fireworks safer. In India, fireworks used to be imported from China. During the Second World War, these imports were stopped, and the safety match producers of Shivkashi in Tamil Nadu began manufacturing fireworks for Deepavali. In 1992, the country used about 60 crores worth of firework, and 60 to 70 percent of this came from Shivkashi. In Shivkashi, fireworks are manufactured in a number of small units. Three months before the festival is the busiest time for these units. Fireworks are transported to every nook and corner of the country. The working conditions of these units are however far from satisfactory. There are very few testing facilities for quality or uniformity, and hardly any safety measures in force. This is why we hear of accidents in Shivkashi year after year. It is very difficult to get information on how to manufacture fireworks because it is not considered safe to give everybody the details. Only a very few reliable persons are taught this art. In many countries, fireworks are not allowed to be used by individuals. Only community displays specially organized with the help of experts, are allowed. A great deal of care is taken for safety at these displays. However, since even children are allowed to play with fireworks in India, it is important to observe certain safety rules. Fireworks should be stored, handled and lit with care. They should never be stored or unpacked near a flame gas cylinder or heater. One should never wear long, loose clothes or nylon clothes when lighting crackers. And since the powder in crackers is poisonous, they should never be carried loose in your pocket or your hand. Also, fireworks should never ever be lit inside a house. Never bend over a firework when you are lighting it and never use fireworks to frighten people. If in spite of being careful, you do get a burn, go to a doctor instead of applying oil or ointment. With care and consideration, we can make our favorite festival a much safer one. For more videos, subscribe our channel. Add a skill by Pritesh Vadgama. Helen Keller became deaf and blind when she was very young. Since she was deaf, she did not learn to speak. So her parents were extremely worried. Then they found Miss Sullivan, a teacher for the deaf and blind. That changed Helen's life. Here is an account of the turning point in her life in her own words. I still remember that morning of the year 1887. I was just seven years of age then. My teacher and Sullivan came to our house that day. Next day she led me into her room and gave me a doll. I played with it for a while. Then Miss Sullivan made some finger movements on my palm. It was an exciting experience. I got interested in that play and started imitating the movements she made with her finger. When I finally succeeded in doing that correctly, I was thrilled. I didn't know that I was spelling D-O-L-L. -L. Some days later, we were walking in our garden. Suddenly my teacher put my hand under the water tap. As the cool flow of water ran over one hand, she spelt W-A-T-R on my other palm. We played this game every day touching different objects. It awakened my soul. I came to know that everything had a name. Now each name gave birth to a new thought. Every object I touched seemed to throb with life. Aha! I was connected with the world through all the words.
Miss Sullivan used to take me to long walks every morning. I had a lot of questions to ask. I would write something on her palm and in turn she would talk into my palm as people talk into a baby's ear. My teacher satisfied my curiosity. Now everything around me was full of life, love and joy. The second stage of learning was more difficult. It was also based on the sense of touch. Miss Sullivan would speak a word and ask me to touch her lips and throat slowly. I learned to speak through the movements of the lips and the vibration in the throat. When I uttered my first word, it gave me boundless delight. Now I started talking with my toys, stones, trees and birds in the garden. I felt amazed and delighted as my sister ran to me when I called her and my dog obeyed my commands. I was able to speak. It was a miracle. When I studied seriously, it seemed more like play than work. Whenever anything delighted or interested me, Miss Sullivan would talk about that as if she were a little girl herself. She taught subjects like science by making it so interesting that I remembered everything. Finally, my teacher began teaching me to read. I first read raised letters and later on read with braille. I learned to write with both ordinary as well as braille typewriter. I was well on my path to becoming a well-educated person. I was provided all the possible opportunities to develop my abilities and I made the maximum use of them. I developed great confidence and I even visited the President, Cleveland, at the White House. In 1890, at the age of about 10, I moved to the Perkins Institution. Here my teacher and Sullivan continued to teach me. I could make friends with other blind children here. My loneliness began to disappear and my progress of learning improved quite well. I learned Latin, German and arithmetic. In 1896, I moved on to the Cambridge School for Young Ladies in Massachusetts. This was really a great achievement for a lady like me who was blind, deaf and could barely produce sounds for communication. I began writing poems and stories. Shortly before my examination, I lost my father. Although emotionally disturbed, I did my best in the examination. My teacher could not accompany me to the examination hall. Then a teacher spelled out the question in my hand and I typed out the answers. When the result was declared, I was so full of joy to hear that I had passed all the subjects. I remember my first day at the Redcliffe College in 1900. I knew there were challenges in my way but I was eager to overcome them. The professors looked far away as if they were speaking through a telephone. The lectures were spelled into my palms as rapidly as possible. I would note down whatever I remembered when I went back home. Here, I began to write about my life. I wrote the story both in braille and on a normal typewriter. The story of my life was edited by John Mackey. The writing was published in a magazine in 1903 and I was paid for it. We the blind are as indebted to Louis Braille as mankind is to Gutenberg. On 28 June 1904, I graduated from the Red Cliff College. I felt proud that I became the first deafblind person to earn a Bachelor of Arts degree. I began to feel that I must educate people on ways to help the blind. My prime goal in my life was to spread awareness regarding the poor neglected state of the blind. Their innate abilities and their inspirations, I had to raise funds not only to sustain a living for myself but also to start projects to remove darkness 
and miseries from the lives of other blind people. I strongly felt that I must give the others what I had gained from my teacher and then came a dark cloud in my sky. I was deeply concerned about that. My teacher's eyesight was worsening day by day. As a result, she could not see clearly. She was brave enough to fight against her problem. But I was sorry because she did not heed to her problem of her eyes. Instead, she continued to help me. At last, my teacher lost her eyesight completely and became blind by the year 1935. She sacrificed her eyesight for me. What a great sacrifice it was. If she had not supported and encouraged me to learn, I would not have enjoyed the beauty of the world. I cannot think myself apart from her. My heart always speaks, I love you, teacher. For more videos, subscribe our channel. Add a skill by Pritesh Vadgama. The devs and Asus were always fighting each other. The devs were from amongst the gods. The Asus were demons. The Asus were powerful, capable of all kinds of wickedness. Some of them were great rulers and mighty kings. In their fight with the devs, the Asus had an advantage. They had on their side a great saint and teacher, Shukracharya who knew the mantra or magic formula for bringing dead people back to life. He restored to life many Asus who were killed in the battles against the devs. The devs did not have anybody who knew that mantra. They went to their chief advisor, Brihaspati, and sought his help. But Brihaspati said, I do not know the science of giving life to the dead. Only Shukracharya knows it. Somebody from your side should go to him and stay with him as his student and learn the secret. We have nobody with us to undertake such a difficult task. But we feel that your own son, Kach, would be the best choice for this purpose. Brihaspati thought for a while and then said, Yes, let Kach go. The devs called Kach and asked him if he could render them his service. They said, go to Shukracharya and be with him as his disciple for as long as is necessary to learn the science of raising the dead. Serve him with all devotion. You may also be friendly with Devyani, his beautiful daughter. That will help you in attaining your objective. Taj promised to do his best to fulfill his mission. He took leave of the devs and went to Shukracharya's hermitage. The great sage received him with all kindness. O oh, great teacher, said Kach, I am Kach, the son of Brihaspati. I want to be your student. I am eager to gain knowledge of Sanjeevni Vidya at your feet. Are you the son of Brihaspati? asked Shukracharya. If so, what can I teach you that your father can't? Anyway, you have come to me in search of knowledge. I shall be happy to help you in whatever way I can. I shall be at your service from now on, said Kach. You need not do any heavy work here, said Shukracharya. You can help me in my prayers by bringing flowers from the jungle. You can also bring firewood for my sacrificial fire, and you can look after my cows. Take them out for grazing and bring them back when they are fed. I shall try to do everything to your satisfaction, said Kach. Thus, Kach began to live with Shukracharya. Because of his keen devotion and good service, he won the favor of Shukracharya. Kach was young, handsome, and very intelligent, and no wonder Devyani fell in love with him at first sight. But Kach was a student 
and he could not respond to her love. All the same Garch liked her and considered her a friend. He gathered flowers and fruits for her and helped her in her household duties. Sometimes they would wander about the jungles and at times they sang and danced together. In course of time the Asus found out why Kat was staying with Shukracharya. They did not want the secret of reviving dead people to be known to the devs and, therefore, they decided to remove Kach from Shukracharya's hermitage for good. That could only be done by killing him. One day when Kach was taking his master's cows to the jungle, the Asus waylaid him and killed him. But they had to do away with his body. They were afraid that Shukracharya might revive Kach. So, they cut his body into pieces and gave the pieces to wolves and jackals. In the evening, Devyani was waiting for Kach but the cows returned home without him. Devyani was upset. He went to her father and said, The sun has set, the cows have returned home. Kach has not come. He is either lost or dead. O oh father, bring Kach back. I cannot live without him. Shukracharya considered for a while as to what could have happened to Kach. He felt that Kach was dead and said, I shall bring him back to life. Wait a little. Then he silently said the secret mantra or magic formula. At once Kach appeared before the master. When Devyani asked him why he was late, he said, The Asus killed me, cut my body into pieces and fed the wolves and jackals. With them. When the great saint, your father, summoned me, I came out of the wolves and jackals, tearing their bodies, and now I stand before you. Kaj continued to live with Shukracharya and Devyani. But the Asus did not keep quiet. One day Kach was in the jungle collecting flowers when the Asus caught him. They killed him and grinding his body into paste, they mixed it with the waters of the ocean. Devyani was again in despair when Kach did not return from the jungle. She told her father that she would not wish to live unless Kach was brought back. Again Shukracharya with his magic spell brought Kach back. The Asus were very disappointed at their failures. They thought of a plan to dispose of Kach in such a way that Shukracharya would never be able to bring him back to life. The Asus caught Kach the third time. They killed him and burnt his body. They collected the ashes and mixed the ashes with the divine wine, for that Shukracharya drank. When Kach was missing again Devyani said to her father, Father, Kach went out to gather firewood but he has not come back. Surely he is lost or dead. Shukracharya meditated for a while and said, Yes, Kach is dead and now it is difficult for me to bring him back to life. I am helpless now. Whenever I bring him back to life, he is slain again. O oh Devyani, do not grieve, do not cry. You should not distress yourself for a mortal. Gods are aware of your beauty. Any one of them may propose to you. But Devyani said, How can I not grieve for the death of the one whom I love? He was handsome. He was great and he was young. No God will be like him. I will starve myself to death and follow him. Shukracharya was sorry for his daughter and angry with the Asus who slew a disciple under his care. At Devyani's request he began summoning Kach back from death. Kach answered in a low voice from his stomach. I am Kach, he said. I was killed by the Asus, who burnt my body and mixed the ashes with the divine wine that you have drunk. Be gentle to me, O oh my master. 
consider me as your son as I am now part of you. Then Shukracharya said to Devyani, What can I do now? Kach is within me. Either I live or Kach lives. Both of us cannot exist together hereafter. If Kach dies, said Devyani, I will not live, and if you die, I also die. Shukracharya was in a fix. He said to Kach, Victory is yours. Since Devyani looks on you with such kindness, receive from me the magic mantra, or the secret of bringing back the dead to life. When you come out of me, Try the mantra on my body. Then Shukracharya taught Kach the secret mantra and asked him to come out of his stomach. Kach appeared in all his brilliance and saw his teacher lying dead. He immediately revived him with his newly learnt mantra. Kach then paid homage to him, calling him father as he was newborn out of him. Kach stayed for some more time and then sought the blessings of his master to return home. Shukracharya gave Kach permission to leave but Devyani, seeing him about to depart, said to him, Don't go away. You know how I have loved you from the time you were a student. Now that you have completed your studies, it is time you should return my love and marry me. Kach said, I respect you very much. You are dearer than life to me. But you are my sister. Both of us came out of your father. All my love for you is a brother's love for a sister. You are great and I love you, said Devyani. Remember, my love for you saved you from death three times. Why did I do that if not for love? Don't discard me. Accept me as your wife. It is a sin if I agree to do what you say, said Kach. We have spent happy days together as sister and brother. Let us continue that relationship. I can assure you that I cannot be tempted into sinning. Devyani was so disappointed that she was angry and cursed him. Since you have betrayed my trust, what you have learnt you will not be able to practice. Kaj said, I refuse you only because you are my sister. I don't deserve your curse. You have done that because of your passion. You said that what I have learnt shall be useless, but I shall impart it to someone else and make it useful. In spite of Devyani's pleadings, Kach had to leave. Kach was received by the devs with great honor and was greeted by Lord Indra himself. Adi Parva Mahabharat. For more videos, subscribe our channel. Add a skill by Pritesh Vadgama. Our feathered friends, it is a fresh and pleasant morning. Birds are chirping and the wind is cool and calm. Chubangi with her family is having tea and breakfast in their garden. Devangi, Chubangi's sister Mitra's friend has come to stay for a couple of days. Devangi is a student of second year zoology in MS University, Vadodara. Chubangi, Fascinated by the call of a bird exclaims, What a beautiful sparrow it is! Devangi promptly corrects her, My dear, it is not a sparrow. It is a tailor bird. See its color is yellowish green and it is smaller than a sparrow. Chubhangi, you are right. But the day before yesterday when I saw it, its color was rust. Devangi, look! Shubhu, this one is a male and the rust was a female. Shubhangi, why is it so? I have observed the female in almost all the species is dull in comparison with the male. Devangi, it seems that you have keen interest in birds. Shubhangi, oh yes, 
Didi. See, Mitra Didi is always busy with her projects. Will you, please, tell me more about birds? Devangi, it is my interest and not Mitra's. I will be happy to talk about birds. Mitra, will you, please, bring a book from my bag titled Birds of India by Salim Ali? Mitra, why not? Sure. Parents, kids, enjoy your discussion. We have to leave now. Devangi, listen, Shubhangi, there are jungle birds, water birds and birds that live near human habitats. This tailor bird is a bird of our surrounding. It stitches its nest with green leaves and fibers of trees. That's why it is called a tailor bird. Chubhangi, that's great. But why do the female and the male have different colors? We have same colors. Devangi, oi chulbul. There are two major types of birds, birds of prey and small birds. Birds of prey hunt small birds for food. The female bird should be dull to hide itself from hunters as it is supposed to continue generations. Chubhangi, wonderful. What a design of nature. Mitra, Devangi, here is your book. It has very interesting information about birds. Devangi, birding is my passion, Mitra. Look, Shubhangi. Here is a picture of a tailor bird's nest. Shubhangi, wow. It's cool. Devangi, let's talk about another interesting bird. Look, this is Indian grey hornbill. This bird is common in Indian subcontinent. It has grey feathers all over the body with light grey and dull belly. Shubhangi, yup didi, where does it live? Devangi, its habitat is both in wild as well as urban areas, especially large trees. Shubhangi, its beak is quite strange, isn't? Devangi, yes, dear. Its beak or bill has an extra portion like a horn and that's why it is called hornbill. One more interesting thing is that it nests in hollows of tall trees. The female enters the nest hollow and seals it by the using mud pellets supplied by the male. The male takes care of the female and its newborn chicks. It supplies food to the mother and chicks. Chubhangi what a caring dude! Devangi, such a difficult task to feed the whole family. For the whole day, it has to collect food. For its caring behavior for female, it is called Vahu Gelo in some areas of our state, meaning one who takes extra care of his wife. Chubhangi, wow! That is great! My teacher also says that we should be helpful to others. May I ask one more question? Devangi, sure, dear. Chubhangi, when I visited my friend Nazmin's home in the Polo forest, I saw many nests of weaver birds on babool trees. So beautiful. How do they build their nests? Devangi, Look at this picture in the book. It is a weaver bird. The bird is known as Sugri in Gujarati, meaning one who builds beautiful house. Almighty has gifted us different skills and the weaver bird is gifted with the skill of weaving its nests. Weaver birds prefer long thread-like grass leaves to build their nests. Shubhangi, Didi, who builds a nest, the male bird or the female bird? Devangi, male weaver birds build nests. It takes nearly 18 days to complete nest building. When the nest is half completed, the male invites female for pairing by its song. If she accepts the nest, both of them finish the nest. If she doesn't, the nest is abandoned. 
Chubhangi, then it must be very difficult for the male to build more than one nests. Devangi, yes, absolutely right. A male often makes many nests during nesting season. Chubhangi, poor boy. I remember Didi, I saw some incomplete nests also. Devangi, Shubhangi, the birds are not only our friends, but they also help us in many ways. You know the vulture. Generally people do not like vultures as they eat carcasses or dead animals. But they are called scavengers as they clean our surrounding by eating the rotten dead bodies. Observe its beak in the picture. It is designed to tear the flesh from dead bodies. Shubhangi, yes, the curve of the beak is very sharp. Didi, I have not seen any vulture soaring in the sky for last so many months. What is the reason? Devangi, at present people use medicine to cure sick cattle. When that cattle dies, Vulture eats its body. Diclofenac is very harmful for the vulture. After eating such flesh, it slowly dies within a few days. Nearly 97% of vulture population is lost. Chubhangi, it simply means that we, the human beings, are very selfish. We do not care for other living beings on the earth. Why are we not doing anything to save the birds? How can we help the birds? Devangi, you can offer grains and water for birds. Nowadays, we get to see very few sparrows, right? Where have they gone? Shubhangi, they have perhaps gone to their mama's home for vacation. Devangi, what about the other days? Shubhangi, I don't know. Will you please explain? Devangi, they have left us because we have destroyed their homes. Shubhangi, how? I haven't done that mischief. Devangi, no, sweetheart. Actually, we have designed our houses in such a way that the birds cannot enter the house. We do not allow them to nest in our premises. They feel safe living with us. That's why we call them the house sparrow. Shubhangi, well, I want them back and I'm sure my friends will also help me. Devangi, okay. You can prepare sparrow nests with the help of cardboard boxes. Do not feed birds ganthias as it is very harmful to their stomach. Put some grains like rice meal it, etc., and water in a dish. They will surely come to play with you. Then you and your friends can sing a song. Chakkibe chakkibe mari saate ramwa avsho ke nahi, avsho ke nahi. Shubhangi, one more question, Didi. Devangi, oh, sure. Shubhangi, please tell me about migratory birds. For more videos, subscribe our channel. Add a skill by Pritesh Vadgama. Anchor, good morning everybody. On behalf of Anand Vihar School, I, Anuj Bhatt, the coordinator of the career and counseling cell, Welcome you all to this seminar Bring Out Your Best to counsel the students and their parents. We are happy to have with us on the panel Dr. Nasir Mansuri, a practicing clinical psychologist, Dr. Mrs. Shailat, a prominent educationist in Gujarat, Dr. Manju Shroff, a well-known dietitian, and Professor Ray Mackey, who is online from University of Edinburgh, would take your questions and solve your queries on study habits and preparing for the exams. May I request the principal of the school, Mr. Sudhir Shah, to introduce and welcome the guests? Mr. Shah, 
Honorable dignitaries on the days, parents and students, good morning to all present here. Though it's winter now, many parents and students might be perspiring with the thought of exams approaching in March. It is observed that unanswered questions of the students and expectations of the parents not only lead to stress but also create apathy and boredom for studies. The purpose of this seminar is to guide parents and students and come out with possible do's and don'ts during studies and exams. I am indeed happy to welcome Dr. Nasir Mansuri, a practicing clinical psychologist from Vadodara. Dr. Mansuri has been associated with Lotus Group of Schools for 13 years and helps hundreds of students and parents every year. Dr. Mrs. Shailat is an eminent educationist, author and teacher trainer. And we are indeed fortunate to have her as one of the academic advisors to our school. It is truly said that special activities demand special food habits. There is a growing concern over what we eat these days. Many of you would doubt what food habit has to do with the study habits and performance in the exams. You will come to know some interesting facts while interacting with Dr. Manju Shoff, a well-known dietitian. In today's globalized world, distance is hardly a barrier in communication. We have Professor Ray Mackey, online from University of Edinburgh, who may bring in his international experience working with students and parents. I welcome you all and without any further delay I now invite students and parents to raise questions. A boy, hello sir. I am Bharat from Standard 10th. My question is to Dr. Mansuri. I read almost 6 hours a day. In spite of this, I hardly remember anything at the end of the day. Even my mom gives me brain tonic regularly but. How can I improve my retention? Dr. Mansuri, Bharat, though you have raised this question. You are not the only one who faces this problem. I am sure there are many here who might be having the same question. Tell me, how many of you have the same question? Many hands go up. Alright, have you heard of the Chinese proverb, I hear and I forget, I see and I remember, and I do and I understand? Bharat, I don't understand that. Just tell me what should I do so that I don't forget. Dr. Mansuri, see, there is no fixed method of improving retention. However, you need to identify the way in which you learn. Let me clarify it. There are different learning styles. You learn by listening, writing, drawing flowcharts and diagrams, by discussing, by reflective thinking and so on. You need to identify which style suits you the best for different subjects. For example, to write an essay, you brainstorm ideas and create a web, followed by arranging the ideas logically and constructing meaningful sentences. By doing so, you are adopting more than one style of learning that helps to remember for longer duration. That will help you in improving retention. And Bharat, now stop taking brain tonics. They simply do not work anyways. Bharat, wow! That sounds great. I wasn't aware of it. Thank you, sir. A lady, hello Dr. Mrs. Shailat. I am Mrs. Viraj Trivedi and my son Shalin is in standard 9th. He spends too much time in playing games and watching TV. And because of that his study suffers. What would you advise him at this juncture? Dr. Mrs. Shailat, is your son present here? Mrs. Trivedi points to her son sitting next to her. Well, 
It is quite normal at this age for students to get tempted to play and watch TV. However, there should be a time limit for the same. What I personally feel is, total avoidance of games and TV is not the solution. In fact, that is cruel and unnatural. Rather, parents should make sure that there is a balance between study and play hours. Games, music and entertainment are quite essential for physical and mental health. They help reduce stress. A lady, hello everyone, I am Mrs. Suhani Mehta. I am not sure whom to ask this question. I am facing a different problem. My daughter seems to be enjoying her studies but hardly shares anything on what happens at school and her studies. As parents, we try to ask her so many times, but she avoids discussing the school at home. Anus, I think, we should consult Dr. Mackey as he must have faced similar questions from British parents back home. Dr. Mackey, thank you, Anuj. I hope I am audible over there. And yes, I like this question. If sharing is missing, both children and parents are responsible. Sharing is glue that binds a family together. Generally, adolescents at this age find it uncomfortable to share all details related to their lives. As parents, we must consider this and decide our response to their sharing. Our negative response and preaching discourage children. However, children must read the intention of parents. Not sharing anything may lead to serious problems. Anuj, thank you Dr. Mackey for your valuable time. Dr. Mackey, it's always a pleasure to interact with students and parents. Anuj, my best wishes to the students. Have a bright future ahead. Anu's next question from the students now. Student 1, Sir, maybe I am feeling hungry right now because my parents don't allow me to eat what I enjoy. Anu's, I think this question is obviously for the dietitian. Dear, can you tell us what you enjoy eating most? And tell your name also. Student 1, my name is Priyanshi. And oh, Madam, I love pizza with double cheese. Die for dabeli with butter or cheese. Dream for burger. My favorite pastime is crunchy wafers with cold drinks. But, my mom serves me hospital khana. Is there any relation between studies and the food I eat? I really wonder. Dr. Shroff, Riyanshi, you look real foodie. I like your spontaneity. Dear, yes, there is a direct relation between the food you eat and activities of your brain via metabolism. Heavy food directs the blood flow to the digestive system resulting into slowing down of the brain activity. You must have felt sleepy, lazy and drowsy after eating heavy meals. Doesn't this affect your studies? Ultimately, you require an active brain for studies. Rather than going for fatty foods, prefer to take light and easy to digest food with enough of soup, juice, dal, milk, chash lassi etc. Eat raw vegetables and fruits a lot. Do not overeat. It's not good for health in the long run. Remember, the student who eats light becomes bright. Student 2. Hello Dr. Mansuri sir, I am Kandar. I read somewhere tune up yourself for the board exam. Could you explain what it means? Dr. Mansuri, dear, you seem to be in 10th or 12th. Tune-up refers to preparing your mind and body for a particular task. When it comes to tune-up for examination, 
you need to know how your body and mind work in harmony. You should identify your strengths and weaknesses in the first place. Observe yourself for a week or two. Always remember that your strengths are your assets. Do not think much about your weaknesses. It is your strengths that will help you cope the exams. Secondly, your body and mind are tuned up to the school timetable before you receive board exam schedule. Once you receive the board exam schedule, prepare a new timetable based on your energy level. Identify the best time when your energy level is high. Try to match it with the time slot of examination. It is important to relax to tune up your body and mind. You may follow simple relaxation techniques like pranayam, yogasan, stretching, listening to light melodious music, taking a walk of about 10 to 15 minutes at a suitable time or having a cup of green tea. You can even spare some time for talking to your friends or parents. Maintain a cheerful mood and don't work in frenzy. Wish you all the best. Anuj, students, did you enjoy the program? A big round of applause from the audience, this tells all. I think it's time to conclude our program. It's impossible to express our gratitude in words. However, I am indeed thankful to all the guests who made it convenient to spare time from their busy schedule. I am sure that not only students but parents also gained a lot. Hope we all remember the tips given by the experts and follow them as much as we can. Best wishes to all. For more videos, subscribe our channel. Ed a skill by Pritesh Vadgama. Six minutes to six, set the clock above the information desk in New York Grand Central Station. A tall, young lieutenant lifted his face, narrowed his eyes, and noted the time. His heart was beating fast. In six minutes he was going to see the woman who had been in his thoughts for the past thirteen months. He had never seen the woman. Yet her words written in her letter had meant a great deal to him. Of course there will be times when you are afraid. Imagine you can hear my voice saying to you. I shall fear not even death in battle. He had remembered these words and they had given him new strength. Now he was going to hear her real voice. It was four minutes to six. A girl passed by him and Lieutenant Blanford looked closely. She was wearing a flower, but it was a white rose. He was to recognize his friend by a red rose. Besides, this girl was only about 18, and Maynell had told him she was 30. His mind went back to the book he had read in the training camp. Of Human Bondage was the title of the novel and throughout its pages were notes in a woman's handwriting. He had never believed that a woman could understand a man's thoughts so well. Her name was inside the cover of the book Harless Maynil. He had found her address in a New York telephone directory. He had written her letter and she had answered. The next day his army group had moved overseas, but he and Hannes Menel had continued writing to each other. For 13 months she had written to him regularly. Even when his letters did not arrive, she kept on writing. Now he believed that he loved her and that she loved him. She had refused all his requests for her photograph. She had explained, if your feeling for me has any reality, my looks won't matter. Suppose I'm beautiful, I would always have the idea that you were attracted by a pretty face. That kind of love would displease me. 
Suppose I'm not pretty then I would always fear that you were writing to me because you were lonely. No, don't ask for my picture. When you come to New York, you shall see me. One minute to six. And Blandford's heart leaped. A young woman was coming towards him. She was tall and slender. Her eyes were as blue as flowers. Her lips and chin had a gentle firmness. In her green suit she was like springtime itself. He started walking towards her. But then he noticed she did not have a rose. As he moved, she smiled sweetly, going my way, soldier? She murmured. He took one step closer. Then he saw the woman with the rose. She was standing behind the girl a woman past forty, her graying hair pulled under an old hat. She was rather heavy. But there was no mistake about the red rose on her untidy coat. The girl in the green suit was walking quickly away. Blandford's attention was divided between the two. He felt a strong urge to follow the girl. Yet he also had a deep longing for the woman who had given him great courage and strength. And as she stood, he could see that her pale, plump face was gentle and kind. Her grey eyes were warm and friendly. Lieutenant Blandford did not hesitate. His fingers held of human bondage, which was to show who he was. He thought about their relationship. This would not be love, he decided, but it would be something precious. It would be a friendship for which he would always be grateful. He stood straight, saluted, and held the book towards the woman. As he spoke, he thought how different she was from the girl he had expected. I'm Lieutenant John Blandford, and you you are Miss Maynell. I'm so glad we could meet. May I take you to dinner? A smile appeared on the woman's face. I don't know who you are, young man, she answered. That young lady in the green suit asked me to wear this red rose on my coat. She also said, if he invites you to dinner, tell him I am waiting at the restaurant across the street, and added, it is a test of some kind. Adapted from O. Henry. For more videos, subscribe our channel. Ed a skill by Pritesh Vadgama.